everybody. So just making sure you can hear me OK? Yeah. OK, so this is going to be a hard act to follow you know, with uh, Steve and Dave, so I'm going to try. We're going to cover a few sections, um, try to do it a little bit professorially as chapters. And I'll start with a quick introduction, and we'll move on to talk a little bit about how we make a difference between uh, predictives and metrics. What are they? Uh, how do you identify them? We'll go through a quick crash course, some of the terminology that you should be aware of, some myths and lessons, and then we'll look at three case studies, two of which are game developers, one from Korea and one from the Netherlands. So if you're trying to decide whether you want to stick around, you should stick around for the case studies. Okay? So quick introduction. I'm Nick Lim. I'm the founder and CEO of this company. I uh, went to school in Boston. And then I worked for the next 15 years in big data. So some of you might know reporting systems like business objects, microstrategy, Cognos. And now in the industry, you'll hear of names like Contagent and Mixed Panel. These are all analytics providers. Well, I've been doing that for the last uh, 15 years. And now I'm on to the next thing, which is predictives. So what are predictives? Predictives are a way to avoid getting mail like this. So this is a, just a nice little screenshot about how many um, direct mail pieces somebody was receiving from Capital One. You know, Capital One is a credit card company. They send out a lot. This fellow actually received all of these in a space of about two months. So it's quite a lot. So predictive analytics is a way to prevent your users from seeing this. A quick slide. So this is taken from a book called uh, Be, um, Competing on Analytics. It's a very good book. I recommend it if you want to take a look. It's uh, by Tom Davenport and Gene Harris. Cited in HBR, Harvard Business Review. And basically what this shows is that there are many different types of analytics that you will do. So most of you who are working on Contagion or using Mixpanel, Flurry, or some of your internal reporting systems are probably doing standard reports that tells you what has happened. How many players did I have today? How many players did I have in the last month? What's the MAU? What's the DAU? What's the R pool? All of this is from the past. You're looking at it from the historical perspective. But there are a lot of other kinds of analytics that you can do. So we're going to touch on predictive modeling, which is right here. And some descriptions here, what happened, how often, where is the problem, why is this happening, what if it continues, which is forecasting, and then predictive, which is what will happen next. Okay, so this axis here just represents how much competitive advantage you are going to get when you implement some of these different analytic systems. So once everybody has metrics, once everybody knows what your MAU and your DAU and your APU and your UPDAO and your payments by country and so forth, it's no longer going to be a competitive advantage. Every game developer has these numbers already. Right? So competitive advantage, low. Necessary, but low. And the question is, how do you get up this scale? This arrow here basically points that as you go up and down, you find that the degree of intelligence, the complexity of what you're doing goes up. So just running reports and telling you how many players you have is fairly straightforward, very easy. But once you go further up there, it becomes more complicated. I'm going to touch a little bit about that. OK, so how are they different? Number one, metrics are measurements. They measure something of the past. Sample things that you know of, engagement, play sessions, and so forth. Predictives are trying to estimate what will happen in the future. Which players are going to convert more likely than others? So I'll pause for a second. So metrics are the past, or even past as in the last five seconds. The last five seconds is still the past, and that's what they call real time. Predictives, future. In the next 10 minutes, who is going to convert? So let's take an analogy. All of us have some form of credit cards and are familiar with the financial system. So what's the outstanding balance on your credit card? That's a metric. You can go into your online system and check it out. What's your FICO credit score? So for those of you in the US, you know this. This is your credit score. Uh, for those of you who are not in the US, uh, this basically means 
a score that a company gives you that tells you how credit worthy you are. The higher your score, the better your credit rating, the more likely you'll get good interest rates on loans and so forth. That's a metric, that's a predictive. The score doesn't mean anything, it doesn't tell you what has happened in the past, it just lets people, a bank, evaluate how likely you are to pay your loans on time. Okay, long list, and the question is, where else are predictives used? What other industries are they used, and how are they being used? So help you sort of take a look at this. So mobile phone companies. So my company, Sonamine, has been very active in the mobile phone companies for the past three years. So we're not new to the games business, uh, we're new to the games business, but we're not new to predictives. We've been doing this for the last three years. So most mobile phone companies will try to predict when you will switch from Verizon to AT&T from Vodafone to O2, right, or from Singtel to Optus, uh, depending on where you're from. They do that all the time, and I know a company that we work with that has 50 predictives that run every day. Every day they predict 50 things about every one of their customers, and that goes out to the call center, it goes out to the messaging center, it goes out to the campaign management system. Another example is insurance, I think all of you know this, the insurance companies are trying to predict based on your car. Maybe you drive a sports car, maybe you're male, you're married, and you have kids. How likely will you get into an accident? Or how likely will your car be stolen? Again, it's been done forever, and they use that predictive to charge you the right premium. That's a predictive. Financial services, another place that Sonamine has been very active in. So in financial services, every time you swipe a credit card, they predict whether it is a fraudulent credit card transaction. And we've seen with our work with a big credit card insurance a credit card company that we've been able to help them improve the fraud prediction by 50%. Online advertising, search engines, every time you do a search, Google estimates, predicts how likely you will click on the first few links, the relevance prediction. And public service, I think this one's quite interesting. Um, in the past, when uh, you're trying to sentence people who are convicted of a crime, you look at how severe the crime is and, and how mentally competent the, the offender is. But now, there's a trend towards trying to predict how likely they will commit the same crime again. And the numbers are extremely accurate. They're much better than any parole officer's individual's assessment. And now it is being used for sentencing in many parts of the country. So these are other areas where predictives are used and it's now time to apply it to games. So in your case, you'll have the question, all right, I get the overview, it's great. How do I identify one? Some quick ways to figure it out. If you're looking at the past, you're looking at a metric. If you're looking into the future, it's a predictive. Okay, is it a past number or a future number? Very straightforward. Number two, can you be 100% sure of this number? If you, are, you can be a very close and 100% sure of this number, it's probably a metric, right? The server went down for 10 minutes. Can you, can you be sure? Yeah, go check the server logs. You'll figure it out. But if you're guessing and you cannot be sure, then it's most likely going to be a predictive. So in this group of players, maybe 2% of them are gonna convert. Are you sure? Well, no, I'm maybe 30, 40% sure. That's probably a predictive. And then the third one is the number of variables. So if you're looking at just a few variables, uh, does the MAU correlate with the opt-out? So there's only two variables. So you're looking at metrics. Come on. Oh, I gotta walk around now. That way. So if you're looking at a few variables, it's a, predict uh, it's a metric, okay? But if you're looking at many, many variables, 50 to 100, 200, 300 variables at the same time, you're probably looking at a predictive. So one of the operators that we work with, they have about 450 variables in the predictive, just to predict one thing, and that is to predict when you will churn, when you will switch from one carrier to another. Okay, crash course. Some terms, very quick. How is it gonna be done? Like what, what, okay, now I get it. Now can you go deeper a little bit? Okay. If you have a group of players, and the red dot represents a behavior you care about, let's say a first-time conversion, a free player who pays you money for the first time, 
If it's randomly sort of distributed in your population base, you don't know who they are. If you just take a 10% slice of the population, you will get 10% of the particular behavior, let's say conversions. With predictives, this happens. When I take the 10%, I have concentrated many, in fact, most of the first-time converters into this pie. That's what predictives will do for you. Some more terms. Base rate is the overall rate that this particular behavior is happening in the population. So let's say a conversion rate, some uh, fraction of a percentage. Decile, so if you go back, you see that I will split the population into different pies. And this is the top 10%, top 20%, top and so forth. So a decile is which segment are you looking at? So the first decile, second decile, third decile, and so forth. Lift. Lift is how good is it, a way to measure how good your predictive is. It, lift is defined as what is the density of the behavior in this slot divided by the overall base rate. Okay, so this density divided by the overall base rate. And go through this a little bit faster so we can get to the case studies and questions. So some more definitions. True positive rate, which means you, you think it's going to convert and you got it right. False positive rate, you think it's going to convert, the person's going to convert, and he or she did not. That's a false positive rate. Machine learning algorithms, you'll hear about this a lot. Neural networks, support vector machines. This is the kind of stuff that we use in the math behind the works, behind the scenes. Social network analysis, uh, this is really important. You look at the connections between your players and uh, find dense communities and simulate diffusion. As you may have heard, there's been a lot of news out there that says obesity is contagious, happiness is contagious, smoking is contagious. Well, guess what? People paying money for games is also contagious, and we have verified that in our case studies. Okay, so how do you know this is working? How do you know that predictives are working for you? A lift of four times or higher in the first D cell is very good. So let me just flip back. So in other words, if the density of behavior here in converters is four times higher than the density overall here, that's very good. Okay? And because high lift means that you have more of the red dots in the small pie, and you're getting less false positives. Now what this translates to on the business level is more revenue and lower retention. Because what you're going to do with the predictives is to change your gameplay and change your promotion strategy. And I'm going to talk about that right now. So this is the output of the predictives. You get a list of users, and you get some kind of a score. This score tells you, uh, it's just a rank, actually. It tells you how likely a, a player will behave in the way you're trying to predict, either converting or churning. Okay, so this is the output of your predictive analysis. Now, what do you do with it? Great, I got it. I got the high level. Are you showing me the outputs? That's great. What do I do with it, practically? For the people, let's take an example. Let's say a free-to-conversion, uh, free-to-paying conversion. First time that the player is going to convert. You're trying to predict that. Well, for the people right at the top, they're most likely going to convert. What do you want to do? We recommend you turn off third-party ads. Why are you trying to distract them to click out of your game to another game. You shut that off. Leave them inside the game to encourage them to convert. Oops, sorry. Perhaps offer them some promotions inside the game, or maybe through email or any notification methodology, uh, methods that you have. Now, for the folks at the bottom, these are the people that are not likely to convert. Turn on the ads. Find some alternative way to monetize them. Okay, maybe cross-promote them to a different game of yours because they may not convert in this game. Okay, so four slides on myths and lessons and then case studies. This is a big myth. I've been doing this for 15 years. Predictives, you need a data warehouse before you can start this. You'll hear this a lot. And the truth is, that's not true. A data warehouse is just an organized, centralized place where you store your data. But you don't need that. I mean, all we need is data. It doesn't have to come from a centralized place. Okay, so example I like to give is Amazon.com when they started with the recommendation system. 
It started very, very early, even before the data warehouse was built. And that recommendation system is adding 20% to their revenues now. Don't wait for a 12-month data warehousing project. Get started now. The other myth is everybody goes, how accurate are you? Is, you, is your model more accurate, or is this other model more accurate? Again, a myth. 80-20 rule applies. Try to get the maximum benefit for the minimum amount of work. And remember this, you all know this already, you can always get better accuracy if you spend more time and spend more money. If resources were infinite, you can always get better and better models, but is it worth it? So the learning here is as long as you're getting around a three to four X lift in your top D cell, good enough, get going. Some lessons. So oftentimes what happens in predictions is everyone's excited about it, so they try it once, they have a, uh, an analysis done, and then they run one campaign, and then it stops. It disappears, because go, oh, okay, it was great. You don't get any value out of that. You only get value if you do it constantly, because your player base is changing constantly. You keep spending money to bring them in, your player base changes, so you constantly have to use predictives and promotions to get the maximum value out of it. So for example, what we recommend is in your database today, you should have user fields that track what is their likelihood to convert for upselling for churn, right? Make sure you have a schedule of promotions and new virtual items that you can promote to people in these categories, right? And build into the game you know, a way of checking the user profile on the fly and maybe changing the gameplay. Testing and learning, very important. Build into your game scalable ways. So Change your game behavior based on the player ID. Maybe you can change the context, the ads around it. Maybe you can switch that off based on the user. Oops. Make sure that your player communication system is such that you can send different messages to different users. You build that in from the very beginning. Okay, and an A-B testing system that's easy to change. When I mean easy to change, a marketing person should be able to log in and say, okay, for this predictive group, I want to try this promotion offer, and this other predictive group, I want to try this different offer, and hit enter, and that's it, it's done. Okay, so we're gonna to switch to the meaty part of the presentation. I'm gonna cover three case studies. One is from a telecoms, uh, because the title of this says, from other industries. So it's a telecom case study, and then the last two will be social game developer case studies. The first case study is from AT&T, from a while back, so it's a, it's a fairly well-known case study. Um, they were trying to upsell a particular product to existing customers, okay? And what we did was we created 22 different predictive segments, and each of the segments had different loyalty, usage, and social network characteristics, all right? And a mail was sent to them, and you track the conversion rate. Conversion rate, obviously, is who actually bought it, not who opened it or who clicked on it, but who actually bought it. So these are the differences in the conversion rates based on the different segments. So some segments use different input data, which is why you see differences um, in the conversion rates. So 0 0.28, 0 0.83, and 1.35. And this is fairly uh, common in a direct mail campaign, by the way. All right, case study number two, quickly. So Easy Mode is a Korean-based social game developer. They have this game called Play Garden that's on Facebook as well as on Saiwo, Korea. And uh, so one of mine was, um, is working with them, actually, and we analyzed the data on the Saiwo platform specifically to predict which of the borderline converters, people who haven't converted yet, but our analysis shows that they're very close, are actually gonna make a first-time purchase. Okay, so first time purchase is the first event. It's the hump, the biggest hump. Buy the first thing. And what we did was we analyzed the data and we used predictive analytics to create two different segments. One was actually a control segment. And the developer, Easy Mode, um, they're very advanced. They have this ability to show different messages to different users in the game. So they show in-game promotions to these segments. So not everybody got it. In fact, only a very small portion of the population of the user base saw these messages. And this is the conversion rate uh, results. Without the predictive analytics, or what you might call a control group, the conversion rate is some number. That part I did not get approval to share, I'm sorry. But I, but I did get approval to share what was 
the result, the improvements. So if you use the predictive segment, the conversion rates are 63% higher. So this means that they are getting 63% more first-time converters. And I can see your head's already thinking, what is the ROI here? Well, if you get 63% more converters, you multiply that by your lifetime value of a converter, you get the, RO you get the revenue that you're gonna get from this, this the incremental value. I'm gonna let that sink in for a second. 63% higher conversion rates. Okay, next case study. Similar concept, uh, GamePoint is a international developer of real-time multiplayer social games for the casual market. They focus primarily on a little bit elder, more elderly um, target market, and they have games like, uh, you know, Bingo, Word Tornado, they have a Facebook property as well as their own destination site, and uh, overall they've had uh, many, many millions of players. Same thing, they wanted to get the borderline converters to actually make a first-time purchase. And you see a, a trend here, when you make a, a first-time purchase, you can really bump up your revenue. So what we did was we analyzed the available gameplay data uh, into 20 different conversion segments, and we sent the email promotion to the top uh, segment with A-B test. So in this case, they wanted to use email as a mechanism to, co uh, to communicate. So one of the first things is before we get to the conversion rates, the click-through rates in the actual predictive group, so get ready for this, one out of five people who received the email, not open, who received the email, click through all the way to the end. That's a 18% uh, click through rate, which is um, unbelievable. Now, when you compare the Sonomime uh, predictive group with uh, the people who did not get promotions, when you promote to them, you see, and in this particular group, you see 160% higher conversion rates. Again, conversion rates means buying something. And if you now compare the Sonomine promotion group with the random promotion group, you just randomly pick people and you send the promotion to them because you didn't know who else you should pick. Again, you see a 150% um, higher conversion rate. So the numbers are astounding in terms of what you can get in terms of monetizing your base. So you really spend a lot of money to bring them into your system. Now, how do you get more by, of course, providing an engaging game, but also getting the people who are close to paying you money across that final hub. First step, you gotta find them. And that's what predictives will do for you. Okay, I'm getting the hook soon. So in the case of GamePoint, they estimate that if they run this on a continual basis, um, they will increase their overall conversions by 10%, but more importantly, the ROI on the investment on predictive analytics is 5X, and, and can be higher because they will also wanna do some retention as well. And the final note, games as a service. So when you run games as a service and you have a lifetime of a game, which is maybe two, three years, you need to manage the player base. So you need a, a predictive player management system. Something that the telecoms have been doing for many years, and we have a lot of experience in that, and we're taking it into the games business. Um, a list of resources that when this is posted, you can go ahead and click through and read more, find out a little bit more. And um, if you have any questions, we can do that now, and uh, you can always contact me, or Dan, who is sitting over here, if you have any questions. So I, I think I'll open it up to questions. Great. Yep. Silence. So for those of you in the audience, how, how many of you run some kind of analytic system that allows you to see the performance of your game service? So and keep your, yeah, so keep your hands up if you use it every day. A lot, a lot, a lot about half, it seemed like. Yeah. So one of the things that I've noticed and one of the reasons why I was so excited to have Nick here is that it, looking at metrics is, is certainly the first step to understanding your player's behavior. The next step beyond that is predicting that behavior and being able to speak to people individually with something that's super contextual about something they might want to do tomorrow. Um, so great opportunity to have, have a conversation with somebody who does that for a living. It's very rare in this particular market, but I think that this time next year, everybody will be doing it. That's the challenge to all of you. Next time, to, next year he'll ask the question, how many of you are using predictive analytics? And all of you should have your hands up. Any questions out there? Right there. Hi. I have a question. When you're sending the email campaign out to these users and you're, you're using predictive 
predictive analytics to um, decide which ones to send the email campaign to, why not just send it to everybody anyway because some of them will convert anyway? Is it the cost of the email campaign or? <laughs> because you don't want to piss off your players. <laughs> There's another aspect of that too, right? Because, I mean, you have a limited number of messages that you can effectively get a player to listen to, right? So you want to hit them with a message that they're ready to hear. If you're hitting somebody who just joined your game 30 seconds ago with an opportunity to purchase something, they're not going to be interested in that you might be better off to hit them with some other kind of message. And so the way that I think of predictives is a, is a way to segment my user base so that I can talk to each one of them more effectively. And uh, a little bit more detail on that. Usually that's what's called a communication frequency number, which usually falls around once a week. Right? So if you know you can only touch a player one time a week, what do you want to send them? Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. Any others? Hi, Tara. Um, so for the emails that converted the best, um, that actually got users to buy, what was their promotion? Was it a discount on the currency, or was it a particular item, or what was that sort of magic that got that you know, one out of five to actually click it? The question is, what was the special email promotion that got them to convert? So first thing, the same email or promotion was provided to both the control group as well as the predictive group, okay? So it's the same thing. So it wasn't like different groups got different promotions. So that's important. In the case of easy mode, they offered a special tree package. Trees are very popular in Korea. So it was a special one, not a one-time, but a, a combined bundle.